Say Sam all together. Sam. Sam. <laughs> now one more, one more. Just to stay still. One, two, three. Yeah. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. You choose how to dress, you choose uh, to be a woman one day, men one day. 
the problem is that most social institutions, not all, but most social institutions, are constructed on this difference. Is it a good thing? Maybe not. I'm not expressing any value judgment. Maybe the idea to base institutions on gender is idiotic and or bad or, or reactionary and should be dispensed with and we should be build institutions which are gender neutral. Maybe we should do this, but we don't have them yet. Because we don't have them yet, if people were to choose gender just because they read an article or watched a television show, which is the vector of contagion, then we're in serious trouble institutionally. And we are in serious trouble as far as relationships, for example. Marriage, family, community, mm -hmm. and so on. Because all of this is, is based on, on gender. Now, it's not the same. It's not to say, for example, the same-sex marriage is a problem. It's not a problem. Because the institution is preserved. These people have a biological identity that corresponds to the gender identity. They, homosexuals, are biologically formed. So it's okay, it's one-on-one, -on -one. it's biology, gender, institution, nothing is broken. That's why it was easy for the Supreme Court and so on to accept same-sex marriage. It's still, it's still the paradigm that there is a correspondence between biology, gender, institution. So same-sex marriage is, is, is not disruptive, it's perfectly okay. Not so, not so. Um, a mass hysteria of transgender conversion. Because that's a serious problem. Because in this, in this case, there is no correspondence between biology, gender, and institution. And we have constructed all civilization based on, on this correspondence. There have been periods in history where homosexuality was utterly common. Actually, in ancient Greece, in ancient Greece um, every youth, every youth has gone through a homosexual experience. Um, at the end of, of his study, or, it was his, it was only made. Uh, every youth went through this. The, the, the mentor, what well, today would be called a professor, had sex with a student, that was a, an initiation right. Not to mention in the army, where homosexuality was encouraged in order to create cohesion of fighting units or, or military units. So homosexuality is a very long history, it's biologically de determined, corresponds to the gender perception and, and therefore it was wrong not to extend to homosexuals all the right that heterosexuals have, including the right to marry. It is not disruptive of anything. Society is intact. The transgender hysteria or psychosis is threatening the foundations of civilization. It's a problem. It's a very serious problem. And it also drowns out the authentic voices, because there are a few people who really feel that they are not their assigned gender. There are such people. This is, this is totally psychologically determined, but they still, the feeling is still real. And these people are drowning in the victimhood movement of, of transgender, in the, in the spectacle of transgender, in the hysteria and psychosis of trans transgender in the politicization of transgender. These authentic few individuals who really have gender dysphoria, <laughs> for whatever reason, probably psychological, but it doesn't matter, it's real, they're drowning, they are, they are hijacked, and in my view, they're abused by the advocates of transgenderism as a human right. I think they're abused, I think they're leveraged. And so this leads us back to the British Columbia study, where They've shown, they've demonstrated that many victim movements are hijacked by narcissists and psychopaths. So it's a narcissistic phenomenon. And as you can see, I'm, I'm pretty liberal. I'm not, I don't have, I try not to have any, any biases and so on. I, I do agree that sex and gender are not related, are not related, absolutely. There are societies where gender is chosen, there's nothing to do with the sex and so on. But the transgender, Psychosis is uh, bad in every way that I can see. Thank you very much for the very. The parental entity in interject is, is a benign entity. It's an entity that guides you, provides inhibitions, uh, tell you what you're doing wrong and what you're doing right.
cetera, et cetera. It's a friend. It's a friend. It's a good friend. And like every good friend, um, it is basically honest and not afraid to tell you when you're doing something wrong. It's an advisor. It's a lifelong advisor. It's a guy. It's a compass. So it's a good voice. It's a good set of interject. When the mother is a dead mother, the mother introject, of course, is a dysfunctional introject, or an introject that causes dysfunction in the child. Because the introject is likely to encompass uh, absence, depression, harsh criticism, sadistic outbursts, and so on and so forth. So the mother introject becomes an internal enemy, kind of. We call it much later in life the secretary object. This is the first the secretary object upon which is a template, a template upon which the narcissist constructs the secretary objects later in life. Later, when the narcissist has intimate partners, he converts them into the secretary objects that, of course, resemble the template, the mother introject. That's why the narcissist tries to convert all his intimate partners into mothers. The only template he has is this. So this is the mother introduction. The child then creates gradually, probably between 18 months and 36 months, there's a debate. Some scholars, like Margaret Mahler, think that it ends at 24 months. Jean Piaget thinks it's 36 months. Albert Bandura, for example, thinks it lasts much longer. So there's a big debate, never mind. Around the ages of two to three years old, the child creates a false self. A false self is a god, cut a long story short. It's a god, and it is as powerful as the mother introject. It holds the mother introject in check. It controls her, prevents her from attacking internally the child. The child, the child according to the mother, is a bad object. The child is deficient, not worthy, of, not worthy of love, unlovable, um, a failure, a loser, ugly, stupid. Um, the child is is a recipient of conditional love, love conditioned upon performance. The child is instrumentalized, sometimes weaponized, parentified, etc., etc. So the child is the repository of bad qualities, a hopeless case. So to speak. Because of the process of splitting, I'm not going to repeat the whole three days here, yeah? I'm just going to, because of the process of splitting, uh, the child is all bad. His mother has to be all good. It's terrifying if mother is bad. It's a terrifying thought. So the child is all bad, mother is all good. This is the child. He's all bad. Next stage is the child merges, becomes one with the false self. He becomes one with the false self. But by doing this, the child introduces a bad object into the false self, thereby rendering the false self less than divine, and of course not omnipotent. So the merger or the fusion weakens the false self, weakens it to the point that it can no longer counteract the mother introject. At that point, the child is faced with a choice. He, the child can subject itself to the mother introject, you know, perpetually. Some children, some children maintain this choice and become borderline. Some children um, even allow the mother to dominate the false self and sort of become codependent, so people pleasers and so on. The narcissistic child has another solution. Narcissistic child extricates itself from the false self, detaches itself from the false self, thereby restoring the false self's divinity or godlike power. Because not the bad object is again outside the false self. And the false self is now restored to its former grace and stature. Now the false self can again constrain the mother introject. There is industrial peace on this level. There are no internal attacks, no internal attacks, no internal dissonance, no internal conflict here. But the child now becomes all bad. There is even a catch-22. The 
the, bad, the more divine the false self, the more perfect, the more good, the more everything, the, the worse of the child, because it's the result of a splitting, splitting defense. So if the false self is seven, the child is three, but if the false self is ten, the child is zero. The more the child idealizes, or actually clinically perfects, the more the child perfects and idealizes the false self, the more the child has to denigrate itself, render itself a bad object. Think of it as two, uh, two baskets. In one, in one of the baskets, there's everything that is bad, and in the other basket, there's everything that is good. This is splitting. So, if the false self is all good, 100% good, the child must be 100% bad. This, is, uh, this of course, is intolerable. <laughs> intolerable to, to the child. So it creates uh, serious, dramatic consequences. The child's next move is to try to find a mother's substitute. Someone asked me yesterday, can a good neighbor be a mother substitute? Can a grandmother be a mother substitute? <coughs> a grandmother might, might, you know, make the cut. A grandmother might make it. Could, could be. Grandmother could be. But neighbors, teachers, no. Because intimacy is required. Intimacy, love, and definitely a sexual dimension. As Freud and many others have noted, law government Freud, there is a sexual dimension to the relationship. <coughs> relationship between a child and, and a parent. So this is absent, hopefully, absent in teachers, in neighbors, and so on so forth. They can't fulfill, they can't fulfill the role of a mother in children. So the child has to wait throughout the life of, of, the, of the child until the child is capable of finding an intimate partner to replace the mother in children. The child experiences dissonance, anxiety, and depression. Indeed, the vast majority of narcissists and the history of anxiety disorders, depressive disorders, uh, previous, previous to their adulthood, in adolescence and so on. The overwhelming vast majority of people diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder have had a history of anxiety disorders and depressive disorders throughout childhood and adolescence. Before they find an Depression and depression and anxiety actually then vanish in many many narcissists the minute they start to have intimate or so-called intimate relationships with insignificant others. <laughs> so I'm not saying significant others, but insignificant others and pseudo-intimate relationships. The minute, in other words, they're able to replace the mother introject, most narcissists can no longer be diagnosed with anxiety disorders or depressive disorders. This is a very telling, very telling fact. It means that up until the stage that the narcissist is able to find an intimate partner, the narcissist is dissonant. After this phase, once the narcissist finds a substitute mother introject, an intimate partner, the narcissist becomes consonant, which is why many, many scholars have made the mistake of saying that narcissists are happy-go-lucky, that they are egosyntonic, that they, are, they love themselves because they are consonant. The minute they have the mother introject, they no longer have an internal conflict. They lose the anxiety, they lose the depression. But, again I repeat, the vast majority of children who would become narcissists have an anamnetic history, an anamnetic history of anxiety and depression. That's a fact. By the way, another surprising fact <coughs> is that psychopaths have a history of anxiety disorders. That's a new discovery. <coughs> okay, I really like being with you. Bye bye. <laughs> I will never do this to you. I will never abandon you. <laughs> I'm a good mother in your <laughs> Okay. We are about to we're about to begin with cold therapy. We're not called not cold therapy, we're about to begin to learn about cold therapy. And to 
This is, this is crucial, that's why I dedicated scarce moments to this, because what cold therapy does, it eliminates the false self by collaborating with the punitive, by collaborating with the punitive mother interject. To be clear, this is an exceedingly risky strategy. Many would say unethical, but risky definitely. Um, evoking or reviving the mother interject or endow empowering, empowering the mother interject at the expense of the false self, of course, causes the child to remain, because the child exists, even if you are 90 years old, the child is like home, causes the child to, re to, be, to, to remain defenseless. So the child is forced to interact with the mother interject. The child, for example, uh, for the first time, again experiences the profound shame that Masterson and others describe. So there's a feeling of profound shame. The child uh, feels uh, threatened, existentially threatened, by the mother infant. The, 